She fell down in the fall. kitchen, that's what happened. Okay. Well, according to uh, Ron, he says she's okay. So, let's move on from there. There are two basic rules here in the college. One, no personal attacks, and two, one pull at a time. Uh, so, let's, uh, I know all of you want to oppose the needle G8, so let's hear our speaker speak tonight. So, but before we do that, let's, uh, get into announcements. And the first one I'd like to make is I'd like to apologize to the college for not being here last week due to circumstances beyond my control that was not able to come and uh, film the event last week. Without further ado, if you have an announcement, come on up front and uh, let's get Now, anti-war and gay rights activist Andy Thayer outlines why NATO and G8 and the May summits themselves should be opposed by most Chicagoans. Described in the recent Sun-Times cover story as a gigantic pain in the butt for law enforcement by retired deputy Police Superintendent Jim Maurer, Thayer has a unique insight into the civil liberties challenges posed by the summits. Let's introduce our speaker for tonight, Mr. Andy Thayer. Thanks for having me tonight. Um, the original talk was to be talking about uh, G8 as well as NATO. I'm going to give G8 a bit of a short shrift tonight. Um, I will say, though, if you're talking about G8 and say, well, what's the connection between G8 and NATO? It's this, in a nutshell. And that is that NATO is the de facto military arm of the G8. That what? Uh, the G8 can't accomplish through, uh, uh, through uh, unfair treaties, uh, sanctions and so forth, NATO or the or various components of NATO will accomplish with bombs. And we saw this in the run-up to the Iraq war. Where first they started out with the sanctions against Saddam Hussein's Iraq and then they led off with the bombs. And unfortunately we're seeing uh, some of the same script rolling out versus Iran right now, and hopefully we won't see the end of that script. But stepping back for a few moments, I want to talk and spend most of my time on NATO. Uh, but before I start into outlining five basic reasons why I think people should oppose NATO, I would be remiss if I just assumed that everyone would agree with me that, uh, frankly, a, a country representing, a government representing, uh, allegedly, uh, this, the United States, which is only 4% of the world's population, has the right to rule over the rest of the planet. If you think that the United States has the right to rule over the rest of the planet, in spite of only having 4% of the population, well then, we might, uh, we'll, we'll just have to disagree about a whole set of things because I'm starting from the standpoint of we think that the peoples of the world have the right to determine their own destinies, that the resources of the planet should be relatively evenly uh, distributed so that we don't live in a country, in a world I should say, where uh, half the world's population lives on less than $2 a day. If you were agreed with me about uh, the fact that people should be able to determine their own destinies, should have that modicum of democracy, and should be able to democratically rule over the resources that you've earned, well then, we can have a conversation, I think, about why you should oppose NATO. But if you disagree with that, then uh, we'll have a pretty bitter debate. So, I would bullet point the five major reasons why we need to oppose NATO and the various subsidiary organizations under NATO and the various other alliances the United States 
uh, is involved in under five basic categories. One, the peoples of the world should not have troops occupying them against their will. And two, uh, the United States, NATO, and its allies should not be threatening war on other countries around the world. Three, the United States and its NATO affiliates should not be supporting dictators and other abusers of human rights. Four, we have to end the insane military spending of which NATO is a major part. And five, we must defend the civil liberties, which are a necessary, the attacks on which are a necessary corollary of being part of an empire, in this case, NATO. Uh, what I'd like to finish with, if we have some time, is to talk about the strategic reasons why we all should oppose NATO. That there is a unique value here in Chicago in May 2012 in opposing NATO and that there is a real value to protests, not just the permitted protest of May 20th, but other protests against NATO. How do they fit into our wider vision of fighting for peace and justice? But let me go through first the, the basic reasons why I think we should all oppose NATO. Uh, the issue of occupying troops. The United States has got troops occupying some 130 plus countries around the world. And we can see in Afghanistan, America's longest ever war, what this means on the ground. Kathy Kelly, who many of you probably know, has outlined this on Democracy Now!, where she has indicated some 450 people a day in Afghanistan are displaced thanks to that war. Some 250 kids a day die due to malnutrition in that country. And last year, uh, the, uh, in the Afghanistan war, more Afghans died than in any other year of that longest ever war in American history. Second reason, threatening war on other countries. I'm sure many of you are not uh, strangers to the fact that we have this ongoing threat of war against Iran. And I'll just use that as an example. You have uh, Iran being accused of having weapons of mass destruction. Where have we heard this script before? Okay, and even if it is correct that Iran is, have, is developing nuclear weapons, which is not something I would grant, but just for the sake of argument, let's say that Iran is developing nuclear weapons. Who could blame them? Who could blame them? They are surrounded on the east by Pakistan, and, uh, uh, and uh, India, which are nuclear armed. They are surrounded on the north by Russia, which is nuclear armed. There are nuclear armed aircraft carriers in the Gulf and in the Indian Ocean, thanks to the United States. And of course, there is nuclear armed Israel on the west. And arguably, uh, Israel got those weapons thanks to uh, USA. And, of course, Israel is not a signatory to any of the non-proliferation uh, treaties that uh, the United States beats up Iran about over and over again. Secondly, Iran is often accused of uh, various human rights violations. Well, every single one of the accusations against Iran in terms of human rights violations could be made against a host of U.S. allies that get arms from the United States. Uh, my favorite is Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia, which chops off the hands of thieves. Saudi Arabia, which brutally suppresses women and gays, and it's the largest Shia minority. And just last year, invaded uh, Bahrain to crush that country's democracy movement. Uh, people may recall that, of course, the invasion of Kuwait by uh, Saddam Hussein was used as the excuse to invade that country. And yet, uh, we don't see the United States threatening war or invasion against uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, uh, let alone stopping the supply of arms there. So, but if we're also talking about, again, moving on to the third item, the, uh, the countries that, that brutally suppress rights. We can talk about Israel in that regard. And of course, for those who don't know, Israel, uh, before the United States, uh, took up the practice of imprisoning thousands of people without uh, charge, uh, does so to this day, uh, and is 
uh, not only dispossessing the, the Palestinians of, of their land, but is also routinely committing any number of other human rights abusers according, abuses according to Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch and others. So uh, all the excuses that are used by the United States to uh, potentially launch a war on Iran, as after all our president says that all options are on the table vis-a-vis uh, Iran, those same sort of excuses could be, should be used to attack Saudi Arabia if, if, the, if their rhetoric is to be believed. And while we're talking about uh, the, the issue, again, the third reason why we need to oppose NATO, which is the, the fact that NATO countries, of course, the United States at the top of the list, support human rights abuses, we have the United States not only supporting the uh, uh, coup uh, the other year against uh, uh, Honduras, we also have just this year supporting the coup in the Maldives when that president uh, of that country had the chutzpah to demand something to be done about global warming. So uh, the argument, the third argument about why uh, NATO should be opposed, the whole issue of United States and its NATO allies supporting human rights abusers around the world is another reason why we must oppose NATO. Fourth reason I would bullet point would be the insane military spending uh, conducted by this country. Some 50% of world military spending, about as much as the rest of the world combined, is bound up here in the United States. If you put together the other NATO countries, the 25 countries as a whole, then you're talking about 70% of world military spending. And what this translates to in uh, any given week in Afghanistan, for example, is $2 billion a week. You stack that up against the things that people in this country and in this, in this town need, and you have to say that the spending on the NATO summit itself is insane, let alone uh, the NATO war spending itself. We are talking about a $700 million Board of Education deficit right here in Chicago alone. We are talking about a CTA, which had a 10% cut a couple of years ago. We're talking about 100,000 homes in the Chicago area which are in foreclosure. We're talking about student debt, which just recently surpassed credit card debt in terms of being uh, the leading cause of indebtedness. And you can go on and on and on. You're talking about uh, the, the having of the mental health clinics here in this town. Uh, you're talking about one-fifth of children in the United States growing up in poverty. There is a reason why the United States, alone amongst the industrialized world, does not have low-cost or free higher education. There is a reason why the United States, alone amongst industrialized countries, has got a third-rate public transportation system. There is a reason why the United States, alone amongst industrialized nations, does not have free access to health care. And you can go on and on down the list. And that is because of the insane military spending. You cannot have guns and butter anymore today than you could have during President Johnson's administration. And then finally, in terms of the bullet points as to why we must oppose NATO is, of course, the attacks on civil liberties. And, and this one, it, it's been a frustration of mine that people don't get the connection as easily as they, as they should, though I think things like the recently announced red zone in parts of the Chicago Loop, uh, the, uh, the Rambo way skiing up the Chicago Loop that people may have read about in the, in the newspapers, uh, Yes, uh, today, but it was, the, the story popped on, on Friday. Um, you have these sort of tax on civil liberties as a necessary corollary of empire. That when we saw the savage attacks on civil liberties during the Vietnam era as represented by Cointelpro, there's a reason why presidents, both Democratic and Republican, launched these attacks. Because they know that if we get an adequate hearing for the pro-war, pro-civil liberties, pro-people agenda, then they lose the ability to carry out their wars. They lose the ability to carry out the attacks of the 1% 
on the 99%. And that's why we saw, for example, Richard Milhouse Nixon so savagely attacking the Black Panther Party, so savagely attacking the anti-war movement and others. And that's why we have a Democratic president today doing many of the same things. It is no accident that President Obama has come in with things like the National Defense Authorization Act, virtually gutting habeas corpus. And as I pointed out uh, any number of times, we're not talking about just losing a 20th century right, a 19th century right, or an 18th century right, a 17th, 15th, 16th. We're talking about a 13th century right, one <laughs> with a Magna Carta that is now on the chopping block thanks to this, this president. That's how low we have sunk. We have a president who's taken on himself the right to kill people abroad. A constitutional law scholar who says it's okay for him to play judge, jury, and executioner. And for those who've been watching the news lately, we saw this rolled out even in more dramatic fashion in Yemen, where the same rules of attack in terms of them not positively being able to identify whether or not someone is Al-Qaeda or whatever or not, are now being rolled out that, that had been before in Pakistan are now being rolled out in Yemen. Uh, and for those who are watching the news again, I would point out that according to, uh, I believe it's called the Center for Inge Investigative Journalism reported just the other week that uh, the attacks, the drone attacks in Yemen now equal the drone attacks that have been taking place against Pakistan. And if anyone who knows anything about the internal politics of Pakistan these days and knows what a mess it is and know just how bitterly the United States is hated in Pakistan, I think you can say, say that that's going to be coming very, very soon to Yemen as well. The wars that were dubbed George Bush's wars just a few years ago have been expanded by President Obama. For example, let's talk about Iraq, the supposedly ended war. Just a few weeks ago, the Pentagon asked for $3 billion for that so-called ended war. And of course, in Afghanistan, as I mentioned, we have a record number of deaths just last year in that, that war. We're, we're going to be told, I'm sure, during the summit that the light is at the end of the tunnel so far as the Afghanistan war is concerned. And of course, we've heard that rhetoric before. We should not believe it uh, from President Hope and change. <laughs> let, let me um, say a few words about, again, the, the cost of this summit, the cost to civil liberties, because the people of Chicago are being uh, asked to accept a real snow job. Every time, on every significant promise that this mayor makes, he says once one thing verbally and then something else happens in practice, whether it's yeah. talking about raising taxes, whether it's talking about expanding the police force, if that's something that concerns you. But, they, of course, we saw this, of course, with the um, with the so-called sit-down and shut-up ordinances uh, against uh, protesters such as ourselves. And I um, uh, had to keep on pointing out to our news media friends that what the mayor's office was telling them was not what was what's actually in the ordinances. And this same thing is true also of the cost of this summit. We've heard various figures uh, the latest that they're quoting is $55 million for the cost of the summit. And they say, don't worry. Not a single dollar of taxpayer money from Chicagoans will come out. Well, even if the feds paid, paid for all of it, that's coming out of our pockets. But I wouldn't believe that because if you look at the cost of summits for other cities, in Toronto, the G20 summit in that town cost close to $1 billion, according to the broad, uh, Canadian Broadcasting Center, okay? Close to $1 billion, not the $55 million this mayor is talking about. And then you have, on top of that, the cost due to successful civil suits against the city. Um, you see this over and over again in, in many cities, just to uh, bullet point uh, a few of them. 
Uh, Los Angeles paid over five million dollars as a result of uh, lawsuits stemming out of the 2000 Democratic National Convention. Uh, it also paid 12.85 million dollars thanks to the violation of people's rights during uh, the 2007 May Day rally. Washington, D.C. paid out $22 million to compensate 1,000 protesters and bystanders for uh, 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 the violations of their rights during uh, World Bank and IMF protests in uh, 2000 and 2002. Uh, we saw just in our city just uh, a few weeks ago, uh, the city settled the lawsuit from the 2003 um, uh, protest on Lakeshore Drive that I'm happy to play a role in helping organize. Uh, I did not share in the settlement, but uh, you did? That's, I did not because I was an organizer. Um, but $6.5 million there, plus probably several million dollars in attorney's fees coming out of our pockets. Now, just as a side note to this, um, when you look at uh, one aspect of the sit-down and shut-up ordinances, the so-called subcontracting of quote-unquote police authority, I think the taxpayers should be concerned once again. This is a city which year in, year out, pays out millions of dollars to people for violations of their rights. And in fact, just a few weeks ago, lost the single largest ever jury verdict in federal court for a case of police misconduct resulting in wrongful conviction. Some $25 million. Largest jury verdict in U.S. history. That's the sort of things that happen in Chicago during normal times. So what are we supposed to think about during abnormal times when you've got one of these summits coming to town? What are you supposed to think when Rahm Emanuel gives Gary McCarthy the authority to subcontract police authority, thus attenuating those lines of authority over the rank and file officers even more? Um, and, and that is a direct provision of the uh, sit down and shut up ordinances, whereby they could conceivably, because the phrase police authority is not defined, they could subcontract police authority to our domestic version of Blackwater, if they so chose. But let me let me move on to um, there's a strategic reasons as to why we need to oppose NATO. And I'm speaking to those of you who are activists, those of you who are genuinely interested in real change. And here, for all the analogies that have been made to Chicago 68, I think a very valuable one could be made. Because my reading of Chicago 68, and I was eight years old at the time, but it's very, very well informed, <laughs> is that Chicago 68 played a key role in ending the Vietnam War because our movement, for the most part, gave up on the ballot box as the way we were going to end that war. People saw the Democratic uh, Party in action with our own Mayor Daley and, of course, the presumptive candidate Hubert Humphrey, and people were so disgusted at the brutality, the warlike measures of those two politicians representing their party, that they not only rejected uh, Richard Milhouse Nixon, but they also rejected the Democratic Party. And I see that as a very positive development. Now, it did allow Richard Nixon to win, but what happened? Richard Milhouse Nixon, in spite of being a vile racist, sexist, homophobe, anti-Semite, pro-war creep, and it was a committee to re-elect the president four years later. Other than that, it was okay. In spite of all that, he was actually probably the most liberal, progressive president in practice of the post-World War II era, including our president, present president. He was forced to do things he didn't want to do. He was forced to institute things like the Environmental Protection Act. He was forced to institute the Clean Water Act, the, the, the Clean Air Act. He was forced to institute food stamps. He was forced to institute affirmative action. He was forced, yes, in spite of wanting to drop a nuclear bomb on North Vietnam, he was forced to wind down the Vietnam War. It was a Nixon-appointed Supreme Court. And 
those of us who are uh, students of Realex know that the first time out, they always say, vote for me because I'm for hope and change. And then the second time around, they say, well, you may not like me, but look at those guys, they're so scary. By the way, there's also the Supreme Court. What well, was a Nixon packed Supreme Court, which gave us Roe v. Wade and the legalization of abortion. It was because there was a massive women's movement in the streets. There was a massive anti-war movement in the streets. There was a black power movement that was demanding real change. And that scared the bejesus out of both parties. And that's why the Nixon presidency will go down in history in spite of his best efforts as the most progressive presidency of the post-World War II era. So we've got a situation now where we've got a presumptive creep who is going to be the uh, Republican nominee, and we'll be hearing the scare stories about what will happen to the courts, what will happen to the environment, what will happen to the wars, and so on and so forth. But I think we have to remember that we were threatened with these sort of things back in 2008. We were told we were going to get Bush's third term. And we ended up getting Bush's third term in spite of voting against his party. That's because if we want real change, it must be in the streets. It is my hope that not just the May 20th demonstration, but all the other activities happening around in this May in Chicago will send a clear and strong rejection, not just of the warlike, warlike Republicans, but of but the warlike Democrats and our warrior-in-chief, Barack Obama. I think it is time for our movement to become independent of both parties if it's going to have any kind of strength. And I'll close on this because I think this kind of strength can be seen in one of the highlights of the African American Civil Rights Movement. In the mid-1960s, due to historical circumstances, African Americans who historically had been Republican gave up on the Republicans because they had not been delivering for decade after decade after the Civil War. African Americans were not enthralled with the Democratic Party either. Because, of course, it was the, the, uh, the, the party of Jim Crow and the Dixiecrats. And what the civil rights movement of the mid-1960s did, what the great 1963 march on Washington really did, was not showcase great rhetoric, though there was plenty of that to go around, but what it did is it played both parties off against each other. It remained totally independent of both parties, and that's what gave that movement its strength. That's what ushered in the wave of mid-60s civil rights uh, legislation when MLK, Bayard Rustin, et al. refused to call off the 63 march in spite of the Kennedys trying to get them to do such. We need to be as steadfast in our opposition to the Barack Obama administration as we are to the Republicans. If we do not do that, we are selling out the principles of peace and justice that we claim to be in favor of. And so I'm speaking for myself when I say this, because the coalition against NATO G8 is a coalition. It's got Democrats, it's got socialists, it's got anarchists, etc. But I'm speaking for myself. My personal hope is that we emphatically reject the Democrats, and we take up the same sort of stance that the Occupy movement has, which I'm a proud participant in, and a rescue, that we reject the siren song of the Democrats in the 2012 elections, that we realize that rights have always been won in the streets, and that's the only way that we'll win them, and that's the only way that we'll stop America's wars. Thank you very much. Now do you agree with me? Just a second here. We're going to go to questions in a second as soon as I widen the lens. But I'm not voting for a vote. I don't vote for a vote. Technical timeout. Yeah, technical timeout.
camera guy in here. I got it. I got it. I You really like that cell. I saw this. Oh, yeah. And I didn't think I was Okay, um, as you know, we have a question. There'll be time for rebuttals later on since our speaker did end early. We're going to try to start maybe 9.40, 9.30, on rebuttals because there's a lot of people that speak up here. Uh, Dr. Laura, it looks like you had the first question. Please stand up, identify yourself, and uh, let us... Let, let, I'm, let us. Stand. I'm Dr. Laura, and um, I wanted to know about, just specifically, uh, the largest settlement. Can you talk a little bit about that jury duty verdict, the $25 million? And then my second question was um, that... Um, uh, I'll get back with that. Just tell me about that. I, I, I missed it. What was that 25 million jury, well, jury verdict? It was the lar largest ever jury verdict in U.S. history for wrongful conviction. Basically, Chicago police framed the guy. He ended up serving 25 years ago. It was 25? Yes. This is awful. I wrote the press release on it. It's the, <laughs> this is the law, law firm that I work at, but all the cases tend to. What was the guy's yeah. name? Uh, Thaddeus Jimenez. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, I Yes. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm just red. 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 Come red, little face. And in the most event in 1968, Democratic Convention demonstration, what was called the Battle of Michigan Avenue, the intersection of Michigan and Alabama. That's the kind of demonstration that you want to see occur in Chicago May 20th. But to repeat it. Does he, do we want to see the kind of violence, essentially, I gather? No, we, we don't want to see that. We have actually um, jumped through innumerable hoops to get a permit for our demonstrations. People are probably bored about some of the ridiculous hoops that we've had to go through in order to get a permits from this administration and then now with the feds. Um, we do that because we want to convince people that if there's any violence that occurs, it'll be the onus on the police that it happened. And, and we have been getting these questions over and over and over again in the news media about, well, Andy, what about, you know, we know you're a nice guy. They never said that before, but they're saying it this time around. Oh, well, you, we know you're a nice guy, but what about those uh, outside agitators, those, those violent ones and so forth? Yeah. It, it is such a total misreading of the summits to say that the violence has come from protesters uh, in, in, in any significant degree, because... If you, you do no, no other thing than you speak with people like Norm Stamper, who is the former chief of police for Seattle during the World Trade Organization protest in 1999, and he will tell you, and he's written an actually quite good book about this, that the vast majority of the violence came as a result of police action. And, and that's why I brought up the whole issue of the various uh, court settlements and jury verdicts, uh, the civil suits that followed each of these uh, big confabs, because it's been juries of our peers who have decided over and over again the police are primarily responsible for the violence that we have seen at these activities. That, uh, for example, during the uh, Free Trade of the Americas protests in uh, Miami, uh, yes, there was violence. There were people throwing things. There's also videotape of many of those alleged black blockers then joining the police lines, i.e., you got to understand that we live in a country that has doubled its so-called security spending since 2001, and a lot of this is let's justify our spending. We have it right here in Chicago during the NATO summit. Uh, Former police superintendent Hillary has set up his own uh, security outfit, which is now getting mega bucks from the city of Chicago to plan for so-called security during the summit. I just debated one of their guys on Chicago Tonight the other night, and he was he was doing this usual thing, talking about protest or violence. And I think we have to take two steps back and and say that there are people making lots of money out of hyping alleged protest or violence. And in that respect, it's no different than the snitches and other creeps that we saw 
during COINTELPRO who, in order to justify their existence in terms of infiltrating the Black Panthers and others, tried to get groups to commit violence so that they could then justify their salaries. So, yes, there sometimes is protester violence, but the vast majority of violence that you see at these sort of summits has overwhelmingly uh, been on the part of the police. And it's about time that the news media began asking Gary McCarthy, and not just us, what are you going to do if your police become violent? I have yet to hear a single mainstream news reporter ask the city of Chicago that same question that we have gotten dozens upon dozens of times. All right. Uh, the gentleman in the back. Uh, you, you, you. Yeah. Um, so I was just wondering, is your opinion what you think might happen, what, what might result from the demonstrations? How many people do you expect? What kind of police response? Um, any kind of beta test for any kind of new tactics? Um, you kind of address the issue of provocateurs, and in the end, how big a deal is this GA summit coming here, and what do you think the result will be from it both on their side and on our side? Well, G8, as we said, is decamped to the backwoods of Maryland, thanks in part to you all. <laughs> uh, but uh, in terms of how many people can com will be coming, uh, we have steadfastly not put out numbers, because I don't have that kind of crystal ball. I think it's a mistake for anyone to say that there are going to be X amount of people. Um, give you a few more of the bullet points of your questions here again. Um, what kind of response do you expect from the city? Uh, I was there for the uh, for the last one that went out to uh, it was an overwhelming response. You know, everybody was six foot six, new gear. What kind of new tactics? We see the black helicopters flying around. What do you expect as a response? Well, any number of other things. I mean, we've been talking to people in other cities. I mean, we in Chicago have never seen these so-called sound cannons. I don't think we've seen taser use on a mass scale. Um, so some of these things will be new to us as Chicagoans, but we do talk to people in other cities. Um, they just announced the other day that beginning May 1st, they're going to ramble up the South Loop, uh, creating a so-called red zone beginning May 1st around the various federal buildings there, stretching from, uh, if I remember correctly, Harrison up to Adams and uh, west to Jefferson, which is encompassing far more than their federal buildings down there. But I think what you have to say that they're doing with this is the same thing that they did during the transatlantic business dialogue, which I believe was in 2002, if people can remember that. Um, there was uh, something called the Transatlantic Business Dialogue, which is some big businessmen's organization. There was discussion, of course, about protests on our side. What the CPD did was use that confab as an excuse to roll out and get uh, thousands of its officers decked out in full riot gear. And for those who were down for the protest or just happened to be in the loop at that time, the, the city looked like a total armed camp. I mean, yeah. it was intimidating to say the least. And a big part of our message has been, don't let the other side intimidate you from exercising your First Amendment rights. And that every move, every threat made by Gary McCarthy at all about talking about, you know, training 13,000 officers in, in, in riot uh, tactics and so forth, that those are direct attacks on the First Amendment in the city of Chicago, and we need to be totally disgusted that Mayor Emanuel would allow that kind of talk, uh, that Mayor Emanuel would su implicitly support that kind of talk, because what it's doing is saying that if you are uh, nervous about being arrested because you need to show up at work the next day, or if you want to be able to bring your little kids to a demonstration, that you cannot participate in exercising your First Amendment right. It is a direct threat on everyone in the city of Chicago, and people need to emphatically reject him for that. Okay. Uh, the next guy. Andy, you're a pretty impressive speaker. I know you've impressed a lot of people in your recent TV appearances. And I, for one, agree pretty much with you, most things. But my one question to you is, 
this repudiation of Obama. Are we to take as predator uh, Mitt Romney, who we know has drained the lifeblood out of companies all over the country? What are, what are we going to have if we do get rid of Obama? Mitt who will really drain us dry. If we don't, regardless of who is elected in November, if we're not in the streets, we can just give away the ball game. I am no friend of Mitt Romney, and as I'm very proud to say, I got two felony counts that it took me a couple of years to beat for protesting against George W. Bush. So I'm no friend of the Republicans. My point, my point is that if we really want freedom and democracy, democracy with a lowercase d, we have to look at and see how these things have always been won in the past, not just in our country, but around the world. I mean, it was not a friendly patrician Franklin Delano Roosevelt who gave us Social Security, who gave us uh, the eight-hour day, or or any number of other gains of the uh, of the of the uh, Great Depression. It was a movement in the streets of, of our country who was the first Occupy movement in terms of people occupying the factories. It was uh, general strikes in three of them in 1934 alone in Toledo, the Twin Cities, and of course San Francisco where people scared the hell out of the federal government and that's why this patrician Franklin Delano Roosevelt who was every much, every bit as much a blue blood as Mitt Romney, if not more so, he was forced to give us those things because they knew the threat of something far worse uh, would have been coming along the pike if they hadn't. Uh, and I think if you look at not just the history of our country, but the, the history around the world, I mean, one of my favorite examples and a very formative uh, event in my own personal political development was how the Shah of Iran was overthrown back in the late 70s. He, this was a man who arguably had the third or fourth largest military at the time, ran a brutal dictatorship, um, and yet when the oil workers went on strike and then joined by many uh, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands others of Iranians, in spite of being one of the best armed dictators in the world, one of the most wealthiest thanks to the oil, he was overthrown by the Iranian people. Now, the unfortunate thing is that, of course, that, uh, uh, you know, uh, that Khomeini et al. came in in their wake into the vacuum. Let me, let me just finish. But the point was is that we can achieve things from the ground up that we can't by electing people. And that the elections, I look at the, the millions of dollars that were wasted on the part of people who call themselves for freedom and democracy by supporting Barack Obama, and I, I think, what a tragic waste. Don't you think it's prudent to have a, an international security force at the ready in case something like another Rwanda or something pops up and there, there needs to be an international police action to interject right away, or like in, uh, in, in Yugoslavia, uh, like in 1999, and unfortunately, I don't think NATO acted fast enough or did enough to stop the Rwandan genocide, but those kind of things come along. Don't you think we should be ready and coordinated and, and you know, ready to move on things like that? Well, I think it's important to look carefully at what actually did happen in Rwanda and what actually did happen in, in Southeast uh, Europe uh, in the two incidents that you spoke about. For one thing, Rwanda didn't have oil. And I think that goes a long way to explain why that genocide was not worthy of being intervened in as de deemed by the United States or NATO. And in terms of Southeast uh, Europe, it was a way of NATO, quote unquote, making itself relevant again. But first, the United States wanted to let the Europeans themselves diddle about, as they did. But it, it's important to note that in the run-up to the NATO bombing, uh, that uh, essentially the United States was playing a double game in terms of supporting uh, Milosevic and so forth, preventing, uh, you know, not supporting at all the, the, the worker strikes that were happening, of course, in during the breakup of that. I mean, it, I think you have to say that uh, that 
whether you've got tragedies such as now are going on in Syria and elsewhere, that adding bombs to the mixture is not going to improve the situation. That some situations that are, are tragic are only, it's going to be pouring oil on the fire. And I think we're seeing that in Libya today, where the deaths have continued, the human rights atrocities have continued, in spite of the NATO uh, forces going in there pretty heavy-handedly. Um, and that's why I like to point to it, because we have to learn not just how to prevent that sort of, of, of tragedy, we also have to think as human rights activists, as activists in this country, and hopefully having some influence with our, our fellow thinkers around the world, how is it that uh, a, a Shah of Iran is uh, overthrown in a virtually bloodless revolution? And that's truly the, the history of that revolution before the Ayatollahs and so forth were able to go into the vacuum. Uh, how is it they were able to uh, overthrow one of the best armed thugs that the world has ever seen? And I think we need to take an example from that and, and learn from it. And I would also point to that in, in terms of, I pointed to the oil workers in, um, in the Iranian revolution who had a key role because of course they were producing something like 75% of the, the regime's uh, foreign currency. When we look to the value of, of what happened in the so-called Arab Spring in uh, Egypt, uh, I, one point that I think most people in this country unfortunately missed was that it wasn't just Tahrir Square that overthrew Hosni Mubarak. Tahrir Square was important. I mean, their version of the First Amendment, if you will, uh, was important for spreading the message about opposing Hosni Mubarak, but it became clear at a certain point that that was not going to be enough to overthrow Hosni Mubarak. What happened was that shortly after Hosni uh, said that he is going to remain in power, literally within 24 hours, a massive strike wave spread up, the, spread up and down the length of Egypt. And that's what ultimately, within hours, had the general saying and had the United States saying, Mubarak, you've got to go, because they were shutting down the economy. And that's what happened when uh, people did those general strikes in 1934 in this country that I spoke about earlier, when people occupied in 36 the GM factories in Flint that laid the basis for the unions of this country. It's because they had capitalism where they needed them, <laughs> I'm not going to get any more graphic than that, and were able to force our rulers, our 1%, to do things that they didn't want to do, to recognize the unions, as is in the case of the UAW and 36 and the Flint sit-down, etc. And, and that's, you know, it's human rights activists who say, well, what's the alternative to NATO's bombs? Those are the lessons that we need to learn. It wasn't just Tahrir Square. Tahrir Square laid the basis and help publicize uh, and popularize the more effective means that came afterwards, which, which ultimately led to the overthrow of Mubarak. Okay, uh, that was a long answer, sorry. That's all right. Oh, that's good. It's good we, go ahead. Yeah, um, you mentioned earlier that uh, these battles are not won by vote, but by action in the streets. But isn't the whole purpose of action in the streets designed to influence elections one way or another, I mean, isn't that, to paraphrase von Clausewitz, isn't it negotiation by other means? <laughs> well, I mean, my personal feeling in terms of the value of elections, and, and I do vote each time, by the way, so no one can say, oh, Andy, you're too lazy to get out and vote, but I, 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 I vote a protest vote. I vote green often, by the way, for those who are green. <laughs> So I think actually this year we should be running Bradley Manning for president because I think I look at the tremendous uh, PR value of Eugene Debs' run for president when he was behind bars, uh, and I think that's that's an ex an example to be emulated. Uh, but Pat, I'm, 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 I don't repeat to me. Re I'm sorry. I'm so hyped up this caffeine. The first part of your 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 question. I'm sorry. Well, basically, uh, you had uh, you had mentioned that uh, you know these issues are not decided by elections, but by actions in the streets. And 
my my question was, <laughs> is it the whole purpose of actions in the streets ultimately designed to influence elections in one way or another? No, to influence public opinion, which then lays the basis for more effective action than just permitted demonstrations. And that's what the part that I forgot about. I can remember uh, being amongst a very tiny, 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 tiny coterie of people who opposed the then impending Afghanistan war in September 2001. It was very lonely to be a peace activist then. But through the demonstrations over the years and through the, the, uh, the news coming out about what was happening in Afghanistan, we have now succeeded in getting a majority of Americans, and of course an overwhelming majority of Afghans, opposed to one of the most popular wars in American history at its start. And, and I think that's the value, in part, of permitted demonstrations. Now, it, using the um, Tahrir Square, Hosni Mubarak example, I don't think that permitted demonstrations by themselves are enough to get you to the promised land, if you will, but they're an important step on that road. But I, in terms of the value of elections, I've got very little use for them. Okay, so... Um Let's go back to, we're having a demonstration. There's going to be a demonstration in May. And you said that your question was about asking what are, what's going to happen, how are we going to prevent the police from, or what will happen if the police decide to engage in violent behavior. Are there any triggers that happen that, that cause the police to do that? Or, you know, how does it, what's the dynamic of this? Well, one of the most valuable ways to prevent the police from becoming violent, which is the reason why the Fraternal Order of Police so opposes it, is recording them. Um, and this is the, the recordings have played a, a critical role in um, defeating uh, police attempts to demonize protesters. Uh, and, 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 and it's how we've won in civil court over and over and over again. Uh, part of the reason why we've been doing so, so many appearances, as many appearances as we can, is to send the message that we're basically putting the police on notice to not be violent. That we know the history, the true history of Seattle, we know the history of Miami, etc. And that has been, the, the police themselves have been the leading cause of violence. Um, and uh, you look at some of the, I mean, uh, one of the, the, the um, examples that is often used by the other side is, of course, the, the Toronto uh, G20 demonstration, um, where there were images of burning police cars. And as, as more thoughtful Torontoans uh, said at the time, why did the police let those cars burn for, like, hours on end? They were justifying their own existence. They were saying, look, you've got to have us there to protect you from these thugs. Because we don't know who, who set those, those fires. Um, our, our point is, is that, um, and I think, you know, I'm a proud member of the Chicago Indie Media Collective. Hello, Rita. Uh, and, and that it's the use of our own media that's going to play a big role in helping prevent some of that, um, some of that violence. It's not a surefire uh, guarantee. I can't make a guarantee, but we're going to do everything on our side uh, to prevent violence. There's been any number of nonviolence trainings in this city. We're ha we're training our so-called peace guides with very clear, uh, shall we say, lines of engagement about how to conduct ourselves during the uh, the May 20th demonstration. But I should also note that there's uh, the National Nurses United are having a demonstration on May 18th um, that Occupy Chicago is having a series of events beginning on the Monday before the summit. It was each day themed with various things. Um, and I'm very proud to announce, though this is an, an official announcement, that Iraq Veterans Against the War will be leading our protest on Sunday, May 20th, and are going to be returning their medals uh, that they won in, uh, in Afghanistan in a, a manner reminiscent of how the Vietnam vets threw back their medals back during the Vietnam War at the White House. However, do you know the reason for the formation of the EPA? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Okay, it's got to start. As I said, I was nine years old and I was paying very careful attention to politics. No, I will not comment on things in which um, that I'm not an expert on. My understanding, though, is that it was the ferment in the streets. My mom was an environmental activist, by the way, against the, the, the steel mills in, in, in uh, Buffalo. Uh, but I, I would defer the answer to you on that one. I will give you an answer to Okay. Frank, you're next. Yeah, um, how legal is for us to film or record the police? And uh, can we be arrested yeah. if we do that? Mm. Under Illinois law, as it presently is constituted, you cannot audio tape them. However, um, late on Friday, the CPD announced that they will not arrest anyone for audio taping police in the performance of their duties. <laughs> Yeah, you know they've been catching some shit for it, and, and rightfully so. And that's yeah. that's why we've got that announced. But so the thing is to, that should be stressed is just because the CPD says that doesn't necessarily mean that the Cook County State's Attorney's Office says it. But I video. Video is fine. Video, video without audio. Um, there is a case before the Seventh Circuit right now. Um, it looks like a very, very good possibility that this law is going to be overturned. The, the message that we were sending today when the CPD was making this grand announcement about how nice they're going to be for not enforcing this law was, why weren't they down in Springfield a few weeks ago helping argue for this bill repealing that odious uh, 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 law? Okay, Brad, you had a question. Okay, let's... Uh... You, you, you in the back there. Uh, I forget your name, so Art. Art. Uh, just a couple of things. Uh, you said at the beginning of your talk that 130 countries were occupied by the U.S. Troops are in 130 uh, countries around the world. There aren't necessarily that many bases, but they are in 130 countries around the world. Yes. Okay, but not really occupying like. Well, they're they're in there. Okay. Um, the other thing was uh, about the Nixon administration. I don't think you can count on something like that happening again because I was 20 back then and uh, the Congress was democratic and the liberals in Congress to, by today's standards would be revolutionary socialists. I mean, that's how far to the right the political yep. spectrum has moved. You know, Hubert Humphrey would be a radical left. But, uh, I'm just saying that. Um, electoral politics. You said everything happens in the streets, but shouldn't we be working with groups and parties that are trying to put people on the ballot in either local elections or state elections? Like the Green Party and the Socialist Party? You know, I mean, we can, you, you want, it sounds like you want to just abandon anything electoral. Well, I, I, my point is, is that when you look at the sweeping changes in American history, there's, there's certain areas you can point to. Um, uh, the most obvious being, uh, for example, the, the civil rights movement and the anti-war movement of the 60s and early 70s, or the, uh, the movements of the Great Depression. And you have to say, what was the motor of those sweeping changes? It was not what was happening electorally. The electoral arena had pale reflections of what was happening in the streets and the Peace and Freedom Party and so forth. But what was mainly happening was what was happening in the streets. And, and that's why I would bring up the uh, the downfall of the Shah of Iran as an example of that. I would bring up uh, May 68 in France. It was when people were in the streets that you get the changes that we all talk about. And yet we have these millions of dollars and in countless, countless hours of activist time being wasted on registering voters. And I would just point out that African Americans didn't win the, the right to vote by voting. I agree. I agree. I agree. I agree with you on that. But at the same time, these movements in the streets were happening. Groups like the labor movement were putting in progressive politicians who could carry out the demands that the streets had. If you don't have the politicians in the uh, in the legislature, how are you going to get your demands passed? You do both. The, the, the politicians change their stripes based upon the 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 uh, tenor of the era, and I think one of the great tragedies of the past, say, 20, 30 years, is that you have the Democrats move to the right, which then legitimizes that right as the new center, and then the Republicans go farther to the right so as to differentiate themselves from that new farther right. 
And, and that's what we saw during the Clinton administration, uh, for example. Uh, during the 1996 uh, uh, re-elect, we're talking about uh, you know, things like the Defense of Marriage Act, the uh, things like the uh, Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Bill, which I point to as being even far more devastating than the Patriot Act. I mean, these are the sort of things that happen when the Democrats move to the right. It's easier for the Democrats to get away with right-wing measures than it is the Republicans. There's an old phrase in politics, only Nixon could go to China. Only Nixon could do this commie-loving, opening the door to red China sort of thing. Well, the corollary to that is that the Democrats have a far easier time of getting away with right-wing measures. I mean, you look at the destruction of the welfare state under uh, Clinton, for example, you look at uh, Obama doing away with habeas corpus. I mean, if George Bush had tried any of those sort of things, he would have been hoisted by his petard. I mean, uh, the, the examples are, are numerous of, of this in terms of what this president has been able to get away with. I can remember it was our first George Bush who gave amnesty Amos, to undocumented immigrants, and it's this president who's responsible for a record number of deportations, over one million undocumented people being deported back to places like Mexico, the Philippines, and so forth. I mean, so... You, you look at trends in history, what drives them in that, it's not elections. It's, it's what's happening on the ground. And, and the tragedy is, is that our movements get fooled by the Democrats' rhetoric. And so we think that, say, a Harry Truman is going to be better than a Republican alternative, but it was Harry Truman who arguably kicked off the McCarthy era. Somebody who hasn't had a question yet, this gentleman's had his hand up. Dave Kraft, uh, Andy, to your knowledge, uh, even though we've got the second party here for NATO, are any of the Eastern Coast groups doing anything or expect to do anything around Camp David and the G8? Yeah. I, I have heard that there are some uh, people trying to do something around uh, Camp David and G8. Everything that I've heard about Camp David is, is that it is uh, virtually impossible to have an effective protest there within miles and miles of it. I mean, it, it's very difficult to get to. The, the feds don't get you, let you get anywhere near. Um, and uh, But we should take that as a compliment. I mean, for years, the, the G8 was held in out-of-the-way places like the Georgia Sea Islands, the Canadian Rockies, and so forth. It wasn't always that way. It, it, it wasn't always that way. It was rumored that the G8 might be coming to Chicago in the run-up to 2003. And then something happened in Chicago in 2003. A sea of humanity flooded down Lake Shore Drive, some 15,000 people, and the news cameras, they, they broke into their national coverage and showed this peaceful sea of humanity going down Lake Shore Drive. And the word that I have heard from within City Hall is that it showed that Richard M. Daley couldn't control his city against protesters. And that's when they started deciding, oh, I guess we better have these G8 summits in other places. And I think, frankly, uh, the Obama administration got cold feet about the G8 summit being here and deciding it wasn't going to be such a great uh, re-election uh, ploy to have angry protesters against his G8 summit. Uh, and I, that should give us a clue as to what we need to do in terms of the effectiveness of protest. 
that protest works. It got the GA kicked out of Chicago, and we should uh, take that as encouragement to do even more. All right. How many people still have questions? Okay, we got one, two, three. You just have one. Those who haven't had a question, please raise your hands. And if we have time, you're, you, then you, then how many others? Joyce over here. Joyce, Bernie, you, and then I think, okay. We'll start with this gentleman over here, and once we get done with these other people who have had questions, it should take to about 9.45, we want to break into rebuttals at that time. Please keep your answers a little more succinct so we can get yeah, more questions. I'll we'll be taking a couple of <coughs> questions at a time. Okay. Would you comment on the, uh, I don't know whether it was a, a rumor or a new ordinance by, by the Secret Service or whatever, but two, two blocks from McCormick's place was as close <coughs> as we could come, is what I heard. All right, uh, who else had a question? This lady back here, who wants to take a two or three? Um, 68 provocateurs of the federal government was telling us to jump into Flushing Pond and Bailey Plaza, which we didn't do. But it was obvious that it was a federal, these people were pretending to be on our side. Question, please? Um, well, yes, that could happen again. Agent provocateur. Okay. Uh, who else had their hand up? Uh, this lady here, we're going to take three, and then we'll let you go ahead and answer. I think it's like, right here, first gentleman. Oh. I would like to know, uh, what are the different police groups that we can expect to be there? We know, besides the Chicago Police Department, and how far away are, will we be from uh, the uh, NATO meetings? All right, anybody? <laughs> one, one, one more, or just wait? I'll help you. Okay. Okay. Well, we had a lovely meeting with the Secret Service the other day, and they actually told us the security perimeter before it was announced to anyone else, and so we just laughed it because we got big mouths. Uh, and uh, the NATO summit will be held in the south building of McCormick. Um, our original march route was going to take us right up to the edge of the west building. The west building will be totally closed. Um, we will be approximately three blocks away from uh, the NATO summit in the south building, which is not within sight and sound. Um, and it's important to note that the United States government is very big about lecturing, uh, for example, so-called newly emerging democracies in Eastern Europe about the effective exercise of what we call here in the United States the First Amendment. And that is to get within sight and sound. They put out pamphlets about this sort of state. They, they lecture other countries about exercise of of, of free speech and so forth, but of course, they don't exercise it themselves. Yeah. Um, which is, is, is pretty interesting, because the United States is very big about preaching about this stuff. Um, in terms of um, police groups, we're going to have the Illinois State Troopers. I mean, we'll, they treat these summits as an opportunity uh, to roll out all of their hardware. Um, so as to justify the expense they put into it. And uh, people may remember from the, the G20 in Pittsburgh that our own uh, Chicago Police Department went there. In fact, there's an infamous picture there of the former uh, head of the emergency office uh, for uh, OEMC, if I'm getting the acronym right. Someone who no city government can help me out. I'm getting it wrong. Frank Gross, who is the who is the head of that infamous picture of him glowering over, along with a bunch of his CPD buddies, uh, this protester who was bound and they were taunting him. And, and, and so they go to these sort of things to get their so-called training, and they, they're big field trips. So we'll get a bevy of, of other police forces here, believe me. Okay, uh, now we're going to go... This lady, and this lady, and then who else over here? Okay. Uh, as someone who's working as you are to um, get those people down for the March 20th, or May 20th March, um, realizing that the police give, they're the violent perpetrators, realizing that you're making efforts with peace guides to um, possibly prevent provocateurs from entering the march. 
I'd like to ask you to talk about the Chicago principles and to speculate on how those principles can be used to ensure that the people who are coming to the march, the people we're trying to persuade to come to the march, are convinced that they do are not risking a repeat of 68 or 2003, that they don't want to get arrested, that they want to have a friendly, family friendly, I think is what we're saying, um, opportunity to exercise their rights to protest. Actually, uh, two wonderful, um, as far as civil disobedience, which is um, very, very critical in, in the duty today, um, has not shown, um, it doesn't seem that it has shown results. Can you sit down? Thank you. Uh, yeah, um, it's not shown that much mobilization of uh, the American people. It's not like 68. It's not like today in Europe. Um, there's some numbness. So meanwhile, yeah, I, I've been there. Um, the question is, does it exclude also working not into this system, but changing the system, eventually coming with a bit a better one, which is changing, okay, working. I ask the question, okay? <laughs> Would it exclude? That's the question. Maybe you were talking to Dan at that time. You didn't hear me. So, is civil disobedience and protest excluding the? Um, let's say, working on changing the uh, funding, the campaign funding system uh, by which our elections and the law work. And the second one, what, shall we just watch Syria? Okay. Um, the Chicago principles, and I'm probably going to miss some of the elements of them, Rosalie, but um, one of the elements of the Chicago principles, and I should note that these are on the uh, Coalition Against NATO G8 or Poverty Agenda website, which is www.cang8.org. Uh, www.can is Nancy G8.org. Uh, and one of those principles, and again, I'm not going to remember all of them, so help me out if you can, Rosalie, is that there is a separation in time and place of tactics. The uh, march that I have been principally, uh, along with other people, putting our energies into uh, has been, is, is a permitted march. It's not a civil disobedience march. It is a legal march. We have defined it as family-friendly, meaning that we are doing our damnedest to make sure that there will not be violence, that the police will respect protesters. I can't give a 100% guarantee of that, but that's part of the reason why we have been calling out the police about their past violence and, and saying to Gary McCarthy, do not intimidate people from exercising their First Amendment rights. Um, the, so if people want to do CD, they're certainly welcome to, but not in proximity to this march. I do think that they're uh, that CD is uh, an important tactic. The other thing, though, is, is that we will not badmouth our fellow protesters who decide to use CD other other tactics. Uh, there were some who learned to their chagrin uh, that this was not the thing to do during the Seattle protests um, when they uh, badmouth quote unquote violent protesters when it turned out when the, the dust settled it was actually the police who were primarily caused for that violence but it was a way for the media and the police to drive a wedge between us as a peace movement that's why you have all this vague talk about black bloc and so forth they're trying to divide us against each other and I think that is a real bad mistake it, it, it accepts the frame of the argument that the cause of violence in our society is primarily protesters and not, in the words of uh, Martin Luther King, uh, the leading cause of violence in the world today is our own government. Yeah. Really, really quickly on the whole issue 
of, of civil disobedience. I think one of the problems with civil disobedience is the way that it is practiced in this country, and that a lot of it is, is prearranged with the police and so forth. And I would much more favor the civil disobedience as, such as was uh, 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 exercised by those uh, UAW sit-down protesters in the 1930s who literally seized control of the factories and it was all illegal. They were, that was theft. That was trespassing and far worse, any number of felonies. But they held the machinery that made the whole society work. And, and, and that's, that's why it was so effective. Yeah, you were sounding a lot like Ron Paul talking about all these bases in several hundred countries overseas. Was there any other peace? Uh, would you consider him a peace candidate? And if he, if he was, was there any other? Is there Ron Paul? I, I, I find uh, Ron Paul to not be a, a peace candidate for any number. For one thing, he's got a history of, of supporting violent racists in our society. Uh, I think that there's, there is a, uh, a well documented. In terms of you know, speaking in front of a Confederate flag and, and other uh, things that appeared in his newsletter, not just against African Americans, but also against gays. And I think his kind of quote unquote peace, uh, uh, his idea of peace is not about uh, being in solidarity with other peoples around the world. I, I see myself as a citizen of, of not of the United States, but a citizen of the world, of the 99%. Uh, and, and the sort of isolationism that, that he practiced, I, I don't think, I think the United States owes a, a huge debt of reparations to the rest of the world. Uh, we are, uh, uh, you know, it consume a huge amount of the resources. I can't remember the stats right off the top. Thank you very much. And we're 4% of the population. And of course, what the United States military has done around the world for the last half century is a hell of a lot to atone for. Okay, in the back. Oh, yeah, just one more. Um, you had mentioned earlier you credited basically uh, an organized union strike for the revolution in Egypt. And I was wondering how you explain in Libya how the demonstrators went from carrying placards in week one to having anti-aircraft artillery in week two to making multi-million dollar oil shipments to Italy in week three. Also, how do you see this in the larger scheme of things, the GA conference, as um, in a lead up to a war with Iran and uh, possible declaration of martial law prior to the November election? Give your question, too. Yeah, we're, yeah, we're doing it. We're trying to think. Yeah, uh, you mentioned that uh, the United States owes a huge debt of reparations to the rest of the world. Um, not to make a case for the mass canonization of the United States. However, what about the millions that the United States spent feeding Europe after World War I, rebuilding Europe and Asia after World War II? What about the millions in medical assistance that Americans, not as part of the government, but as individuals, voluntarily uh, you know, give to other countries where doctors go overseas you know, to provide medical assistance. They don't have to. They're not ordered to do so. They're Americans, and everyone knows they're Americans. Um, isn't it unfair to the American people and to the American government to a certain extent, you know, to completely tar us as the bad guys on the planet? Uh, we're certainly not saints, but are we really the devil incarnate? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> what, what was the true intent of the Marshall Plan, for example? It, it was to uh, try to carve up the world in this, and for that matter, NATO, was to try to carve up the world at the expense of the expanding Russian Empire. It was a battle of two empires to carve up the world. And the United States wasn't stupid. They saw that flooding Western Europe with uh, food aid and so forth. But look at, at some of the, the governments that the United States got in bed with in the course of doing that. They had just fought so-called a war against fascism. 
but that didn't prevent them from uniting with fascist Franco uh, Germany. That did not prevent them from uniting with a fascist dictatorship in Portugal. That did not prevent them from uniting with a military dictatorship in Greece. It was not about humanitarian desires that the United States did those things that, that you did, and that isn't to justify what the Russians did either. The point was it was not out of altruism path that the United States did that. Well, my question though, but weren't we in the end feeding people whereas the Russians were starving people? With one hand, maybe. No. And then slap them. It's interesting because the <coughs> Russians, in their attempt to uh, secure control over the, the, the territories that it militarily dominated in the East, actually provided for a higher standard of living typically in those countries than it did in Russia itself. It was a brutal irony. In Russia, having a much smaller economy, was less able to do the sort of things that the United States did in terms of trying to buy off uh, the, the support of the Eastern European countries that it dominated, but it did try to do the same sort of thing. It just had fewer resources to do it. One or two more questions. Syria, Syria. Syria. Yeah, that was an interesting one. Yeah, well, the, just skip um, over. Yeah. Syria is an example. Well, for one thing, you have to say, why has the United States, the extent that the United States is interested in Syria is because of its support for Iran. Uh, but Syria not having oil has not deserved, in the United States terms, the same sort of treatment as Libya did. Now, in terms of the internal workings of how Libya went rapidly from picket signs to howitzers, I don't know the details of that, but I think the uh, suggestion of how rapid that transformation was uh, says something about probably the influence of oil in the United States covertly trying to, uh, once they saw that Gaddafi could not keep a handle on things. Because you got to understand, Gaddafi was the United States boy for several years after previous to that having been uh, uh, you know, in opposition. But Gaddafi cut a peace with the United States. But the United States has got a habit in countries around the world of letting loose dictators once they can no longer control their populations. We saw this with Anastasia Somoza in Nicaragua. We, we saw this with the Marcos regime in the Philippines, that the United States is all fine and good, bellying up to the most brutal dictators around the world. But when they show that they cannot control their own population, then and only then did the United States decide it's time for them to go. And the United States saw, I think, an opportunity to have a more pliant client regime in Libya, and that's why NATO did what it did. Uh, Syria, in their terms, does not have enough oil to justify that. To the extent that they are concerned about Syria is because of its geopolitical alliance with Iran, which, of course, has oil. All right, let's um, wrap has it not up. had a question? I have Bern, Bernie? Yes, uh, once upon a time we had a mayor who observed that the police aren't there to create disorder, they're there to preserve disorder. Okay, thanks, Tim. Once upon a time, we had a mayor who observed that the police aren't there to create disorder, they're there to preserve disorder. What? <laughs> yes. In that mindset, do you think when all is said and done, this is going to be an embarrassment for Mr. Emanuel? Yay! Yes. Let's hope. I love you too, Laura. Let's hope. Well, well, we just finish up with this one here, we can go to the, the rebuttals. Um, yeah, I can't predict everything that's going to happen. I don't have that kind of, of crystal ball. I think, it, as someone in the audience noted, it already is an embarrassment. Um, the, we, the people of Chicago deserve to have a debate about whether or not to bring NATO to Chicago. The people of Chicago deserve to have a debate about NATO. This mayor has refused to engage in both debates. And yet, we are spending millions of dollars on these summits. 
thousands upon thousands of people are being uh, inconvenienced by these, this summit. But more importantly than that, uh, when people talk about the so-called red zone in the South Loop and get concerned about uh, armed thugs on every corner, then I think you'd have to say, well, this is just a small taste of what peoples around the world routinely face with soldiers on their corners, not of their own country even, but other countries, in this case, the United States. And they're not just there for a few weeks. They're there year in, year out. I think that the summit, the way that it was brought to this town, where the only people who had any say-so in it were the mayor and the president, says something about the lack of de democracy in Chicago, it's hard to believe that could have gotten anything worse than under Richard M. Daley, but at least during the run-up to the 2016 Olympic bid, they went through the motions of, select, of, of soliciting our input. With the NATO summit, no one asked to bring it here, aside from Barack Obama and Mayor Emanuel. And so I think people have a, a right to have a debate about that, and this mayor has refused to engage in, in it. All right, let's go. Thank you, Thank you. 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 Thank Wait, just, just wait. I'm trying to get a counter to allot the time. Okay. Um, I think we're okay. No problem. We're going to go to about four minutes apiece, uh, strictly enforced tonight. I'm going to try my best to uh, keep the time allotted to each speaker. You don't have to take the full four minutes, but uh, you know you're welcome. So. Uh, if you're ready for the terrestrial, what we call rebuttal period, we're going to start. <laughs> Regarding NATO, the, um, the principal mission of NATO was twofold. It was established with the uh, impetus of the United States immediately following World War II. It had two missions. The first mission was to drive the Soviet Union back to its own borders. That failed. Its second mission was to establish a system whereby the military from one nation would be used to suppress labor strikes in another nation where the language was different and there would be no sympathy for the strikers in, those, in that case. The mention was made of the Marshall Plan in Andy's talk. Uh, the Marshall Plan was a marvelous device to promote American uh, prosperity. We didn't give money to uh, the European countries after World War II. We gave them Marshall dollars, which they had to spend in the United States. They couldn't buy from any other country. They had to buy from U.S. manufacturers. Um, I'll close with uh, a, a statement from uh, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, the uh, new left front candidate for president in France. Uh, he received 11.6% of the vote, but his most famous, in my opinion, uh, uh, statement was that it is the obligation of every citizen of the republic, that's France, uh, to revolt against capitalism. I don't remember who asked uh, about how come Andy knew so much, and uh, I Green met Eternal. Andy when he was a small, skinny teenager, <laughs> and he was active from then on all the time. So that's how activism makes a person like he is. Um, I, I thank you. Um, as coming from a Latin American country, without having the perspective of what the United States was doing in Europe, I can tell you that United States, as well as Europe, as a whole, they use 
all the countries as a dumping ground of shit and as a wealth extracting cow. Uh, I just saw a, a beautiful movie about the beautiful buildings in Buenos Aires with all kind of French style mansions and, and buildings and so on. They were all built with the wealth extracted from Argentina. And they were built for the benefit of those who were doing destruction. In 1937, the year that I was born, a senator of Argentina was asking the question, how could it be that Argentina exports wheat, meat, and other grains and wealth, and Argentina was owing money to the United States, to England, and to France? So how could it be? We are exporting all these things. Well, that was good enough for the United States, England, and France to decide that they have to assassinate this guy. Right. And how did they decide to assassinate him in the street? No. On the Senate, in the Senate floor, as the Senate was in session, they hired a guy with a high powerful rifle, and he stayed on the higher up of the Congress when you have the people observing. And, uh, and he went and shot at him. And uh, it, it turns out that uh, his uh, prodigy, uh, he didn't have children of his own, but he was uh, having a, a very young man as a prodigy. And this man saw the rifle, and he jumped in front of the senator, and he was hit and killed right there. Uh, the senator was so broken that at that night he, sh he shot himself in the head. Well, what happened was that he ordered the Marines to bring to the Senate the documentation that proved how the British, in this case, were the ones that he caught, and that how they were stealing the wealth from Argentina. These documents who were brought in front of the Senate, they were lost. They were never brought up to. And uh, Argentina during Perón, uh, a dictator that we supported, uh, and the military dictatorship that then we supported again, uh, he tried, Perón, to uh, nationalize the Wilson uh, factories, which were established to help in the feeding of Europe or, or, or our allies in the First World. And uh, Argentina still couldn't own that meat packing company. Uh, so in the last few years, uh, you must have heard that uh, Argentina decided to don't pay any more the debt and that they, they will uh, you know, be uh, in a total recession and all that. And that didn't happen in Argentina by about 9% a year. I don't think that I approve of the uh, capitalist way of running business, of growing, 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 because we live in a uh, finite world. The resources are being depleted. The seas are being killed. Uh, we, we are in a very bad course against the environment. But the fact is that these, these bankers, these shyster bankers, they want to have all these countries in debt, so they keep collecting interest, and you've never been able to pay the principal the way they, they have everything organized. So anyway, that, uh, we are in deep trouble. Just as a reminder, I'm going to give a signal like this in a minute. So that you I think you went over four on this. I want to uh, come back to the specific topic at hand, and that is NATO itself. While we may have our own feelings and perspectives of what it represents or what it does here in the United States, my six years on and off in Europe the last decade uh, gave me an additional dimension of how the Europeans view NATO. It's decidedly different, I think, than even from somewhat of what we've heard tonight. 
Uh, I'll take it first from the environmental standpoint, because you'll hear about this in the workshops on May 12th, I believe it is, 13th. Um, NATO, as an environmental polluter, is responsible for, number one, using uh, uranium weapons in both the Balkans and, questionably, in Afghanistan. Uh, number two, the Europeans will attest to this, that many of the NATO air bases have polluted uh, surrounding land around the base using some of those jet fuel additives that are, have been identified in the United States as cancerous. Uh, and, and then you have other environmental problems with the various bases that they use. So their environmental record is not great. But perhaps the worst of all is the one that they haven't used yet, and that is two years ago. Uh, every so often, the NATO generals get together and they revise their battle doctrines. Uh, the Europeans went crazy when NATO revised its battle doctrine to allow for the preemptive use of tactical nuclear weapons. Now this has a great deal of diff more difference in Europe than it does in the United States because it's going to be on their borders where these tactical nuclear weapons are going to be used. Now I want to take it back to more the political realm though of the effects of NATO in Europe. Uh, very often participation in NATO has resulted in uh, citizens, uh, military personnel having to violate the very constitutions of their own countries. Germany is a case in point. It is prohibited in German law for any member of the Bundeswehr, either in the, in the air units or on the uh, ground units, to do, have anything to do with nuclear weapons, uh, to transport nuclear weapons, and certainly never ever to deliver them. Yet, NATO participation requires the German pilots to participate with A-10 warthogs in practice runs on how to deliver tactical nuclear weapons. So German activist groups have challenged this in the German courts. I don't know how far it's gotten. But you know, they bring it up from the, the standpoint of politically, NATO undermines the very constitutions of many of its participating uh, countries uh, by these kinds of activities. Uh, the last piece, though, is if you just uh, take a look at the name, North Atlantic uh, treaty organization. I'm still looking for the shore on Afghanistan that abuts the Atlantic Ocean. And I think that's another thing that really POs a lot of the European participants. Is it wasn't designed to do this, and now we're becoming this policeman to the world. Uh, I can't remember the phrase Andy used, but I know in the environmental circles, we talk about NATO as G8's army. And actually, they're worse than that. They're, they're, they're G8's enforcers. That's really what it comes down to. Because it's, it's to enforce that particular world view on the world, and if any of you read uh, Confessions of a... Uh, Economic uh, Hitman. Then you know that there are over 780 U.S. military installations throughout the world, and that rule number three is when the first two rules of assassination and intimidation don't work, you send in the military. That's the role that GA is, thank you, is, is, a, is beginning to assume. I'll stop. Awesome. Thanks, Andy, for your presentation. I'll be joining you on May 20th. The connections between nuclear power and nuclear war are direct and dangerous, and we've talked about that here before. Nuclear power will not give us climate justice, and nuclear power will not solve our climate crisis. In fact, nuclear power will only make it worse, and we've talked about that here as well before. And this is echoing uh, Dave Kraft settlements. That another thing that we're mobilizing and protest about is the mess that NATO left behind, the environmental damages from the 1999 NATO-Yugoslavia conflict. And this is going to give you a little bit of background. The NATO bombing of Yugoslavia was NATO's military operation against the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia during the Kosovo War. The strategic air strikes lasted from March 24, 1999 to June 10, 1999, so went on for almost uh, three months or so. NATO left cluster bombs, which are anti-personnel weapons, and depleted uranium shells um, scattered all over the uh, landscape. And I'd like to uh, quote an article that I found online uh, from the Progressive about this, uh, August 1999. NATO's decision to target chemical plants, oil refineries, and, in and energy transformer stations could have long-term consequences for civilians in the region, Dangerous chemical and oil spills may already have contaminated the uh, Danube, which flows through Hungary, Bulgaria, Romania, and Moldova. 
Moldova. Moldova. Okay, Moldova. Thanks. And a recent environmental study of the largely rural region of northern Greece that borders Yugoslavia has found the oxen levels as high as one would find in a heavily industrialized city. Now, I mentioned that anti-tank ammunitions made of depleted uranium were left scattered on the uh, countryside. And depleted uranium, or U-235, is, is the radioactive and toxic byproduct left behind when uranium is enriched for use as nuclear fuel. The weapons are used with amazing effectiveness in the Gulf War. The problem is that when the uranium shells shell hits an armored target, up to 70% of the material burns, leaving behind particles of airborne uranium, which can be inhaled. Anybody who goes near the impact area soon after the explosion can inhale the dust, which can cause kidney, skin, and respiratory damage, as well as lung cancer. Despite Pentagon claims that the weapons are relatively safe, uh, Gulf War veteran groups worry that the material is responsible for many of the strange symptoms known as Gulf War Syndrome. And uh, the Institute for Energy and Environmental Research uh, from Tacoma Park, Maryland, we've mentioned before, brought us the carbon-free, nuclear-free energy pathway. And they did a report, and they concluded that besides causing longer-term environmental damages, which I've mentioned here, that another conclusion was the NATO bombing of Yugoslavia also breached international humanitarian law. Thanks a lot. I am worried. Uh, I'm worried about the uh, May 20th demonstration. I do not evaluate the 1968 demonstrations in Chicago the same way Andy does. Um, I think they had it was, it was a very harmful set of demonstrations here in Chicago. I think it severely harmed the anti-Vietnam War movement. Uh, because it frightened the majority of the population away from participating in the movement. They wanted no part of that type of street activity. Uh, I think it also severely damaged the Democratic Party. And I grant the Democratic Party has a lot of shortcomings, but in some respects it, it attempts to be the uh, vehicle for promoting humanitarian rights in this country. Uh, I do not think the election of Richard Nixon was a advance in society. As a matter of fact, I think if you look at the history of politics in this country since those demonstrations, you find a steady progression towards the right. And this was started, I think, by many of the actions of the Nixon administration. Any activity that promoted the interests of the Republican Party at that time or at present I think it's a bad thing to do. Uh, third, I think it damaged Chicago, and I'm a Chicago, and it damaged the reputation of this city throughout the world, and I think that's a bad thing. I don't like Chicago known as the home of hoodlums. I don't like it known as the home of uh, police who riot, uh, the destruction of civil liberties. I do not like this type of activity. Second, I have a difference in Andy's concept of a humanitarian movement. I believe in being in the streets. I was arrested with Andy a number of years ago for being in the streets. Uh, I participated in the anti-Vietnam War movement. In the 1967 demonstration of the Pentagon, there were 75,000 of us in the streets, and about 50, you know, about 6,000 were arrested. Uh, in 1969, in the demonstration in Washington, there were 500,000 people in the streets protesting the Vietnam War. Uh, a number of the people eventually there were arrested. These demonstrations, I think, promoted the interests of the anti-Vietnam War movement because primarily the sponsoring organizations were committed to strategies of nonviolence. They were officially committed to those strategies, and I think that that's what made those demonstrations ultimately work. I do not find such a commitment in the current anti-Afghanistan uh, war coalition in the city. I'm worried about that. Family friendly does not seem to be enough. I think that this coalition be, should be on paper committed to the fact that they believe 
the nonviolent tactics are the best tactics to use in promoting the anti-Vietnam War movement and other movements for social justice and economic justice. Finally, I think that the, uh, the, the demonstrations May 20th around NATO should be focused on the Afghanistan war. This is what the major involvement in NATO today in destructive, unhumanitarian activities. Uh, I think that this is what ought to be emphasized. Stop that war. Get NATO out of supporting uh, what are essentially imperialistic occupation activities by the United States. This is where our focus should be. Do uh, have any more minutes? Five seconds. Five seconds. Ah, Thank you very minute. much. I hope we're all out at the demonstrations. I hope they'll be nonviolent. Uh, and I hope it stops the war in Afghanistan and it humanizes the city of Chicago, our police department and mayor, and a president of the United States, President Obama, too. Because I think that that can be done. We're all human. Good um, I want to thank Andy for his presentation. I think it was extremely good. I'm sorry. Okay, here we go. I don't need to repeat my uh, salutation. Anyway, um, my point is going to be specifically on the statement with respect to Richard Nixon was forced to, to form the EPA. Yes, he was forced to form it. He did everything in his power to reduce and limit its, its power. First of all, we live in a corrupt plutocracy ruled by 1%. And this is not just as a consequence of recent events. This actually goes back to the founding of the country. If you don't believe me, read Domov as G. William Domov. The politicians are the best government that money can buy. They listen only to the rich and to the lobbyists, and they don't listen to you. Therefore, haranguing or pleading with the politicians is for all intents and purposes a waste of time. Um, the courts, for the most part, are pro-business. Uh, there are exceptions, of course. There are decent, decent uh, charges. Unfortunately, if you take a look at the sum total of court action in this country, you should be absolutely uh, disgusted. Now, as far as the EPA, what was the EPA actually formed for? To make sure that commerce and industry should not, should not be restricted. And if you don't believe me, look at the enabling legislation. The states followed suit. Uh, essentially, what they've been put on is massive research with very little action. Um, take a look at the way the individuals within the EPA act. Most of them are cycling through revolving doors. They get, at the end of their tenure in the government, they get jobs with the very people that they're supposed to be regulating. That does seem a little strange. Um, look at the super fund. A great deal of money has been set aside. Very little of it has been used to actually clean up things. Um, from personal experience, I went to Washington and fought with members of the EPA, along with other people, obviously not on my own, relative to uh, clean water. What I found was skullduggery, sabrosa actions, and minimal effective uh, action. As far as the Great Lakes are concerned, there's continued pollution, continued uh, um, invasion by exotics, and there is stealing of the fresh water, which is one of our major resources considering what's coming, and with very little control and very little regulation. Um, look at the directors of the EPA. Look at their experience. Look at their training. Big surprise, most of them had no training in science and no training in health. Um, massive abuse by the Department of the Interior, the uh, Bureau of Land Management, and the Bureau of Mines. Continued destruction of all of those lands, much of that could be controlled 
by the EPA, but is not. What we need is a reversal of this, and I hope that you will take action in one way or another to support this kind of action. Thank you very much. I'm Michael Foley. My first point, my first point might not seem specific to, to what's going on in our city today, but it is. My second point is specific to what's happening in our city. The first thing, on September 15th, 1935, the Nuremberg Laws were announced in Germany. I'm not familiar with all the specifics of these laws, but these laws said that Jewish people who were living in the country of Germany no longer had any kind of rights at all. I believe that this year, which is the 77th anniversary of the Nekman Needs Laws, this anniversary is going to be observed in this country. For whatever reason, 77 years is significant. I don't know why. I believe that this year, in mid-September, it's going to be obvious to all of us living in this country that we no longer have any rights in this country. I know that sounds crazy, insane, stupid, and maybe it is, and maybe I am absolutely wrong. But I do believe that mid-September, it's, oh, it's not going to be just Jewish people ain't going to have rights. None of us. Nobody. Now, naturally, rich people, super rich people, they always got rights. They got what they can buy. But I'm talking about the vast, vast majority of people in this country will have no rights at all. Now, as far as what's happening in our city today, the Empire sends guys with guns to places to kill people who are living in those places. That's the only reason the Empire ever sends guys with guns anywhere. It sends guys with guns to places to kill people. The Empire has been sending lots of guys with lots of guns to our city for a couple weeks or a couple months, however long it is. A week and a half ago, there was helicopters flying around in the city of Chicago. The helicopters were loaded with guys who had guns, who were pointing the guns at the people of the city of Chicago. And we were told it was a test. It was a test, a dress rehearsal. They told us that. They're pointing guns from helicopters at us. And they said, this is a test. <laughs> also, they've been sending Secret Service, FBI, ATF, DEA, Homeland Security. And now we were told that this Tuesday, they're sending soldiers. We're told that this Tuesday, there's going to be soldiers in downtown Chicago riding around in military vehicles, military uniforms, military guns. Remember, the Empire sent guys with guns to a place to kill the people who are living in that place. Now, I don't know what's going to happen in the next three weeks. But if people here get killed, or people get their ass kicked, or knocked around, or cuffed around, or beat up, or smacked, or whatever, that's what the Empire does. That's all I got. Thank you. Uh, Andy, thanks a lot. Uh, I knew some of that, but I'm slow. I need to hear it again and again and again and again. Uh, I would recommend the book, A Force More Powerful by Ackerman and Duval, if you're interested in nonviolent resistance. Uh, my point is, we're going to have to do what John L. Lewis said a couple years ago, many years ago. Organize, organize, organize. Two examples, quick ones. Uh, on April uh, 17th, uh, three of us UUs, including Jerry there, and myself, and uh, Gene Darling, Reverend Gene Darling, went out and gave out the war resistor flyer. 
Have you ever seen this thing that says that's what you're supposed to do? Number one, give out this flyer on tax pay. We did that, uh, and we gave out a couple hundred of them, and uh, they finally kicked us out of the federal policy. But anyway, uh, but I still felt pretty lonely. Yeah, we tried. We got nothing to be embarrassed about. We did the best we can. Example, though, number two. Uh, LAC, Lakeview Action Coalition, is going to have an action assembly. It's going to be uh, May uh, 6th. It's going to be at 2335 uh, North Orchard, 2 o'clock in the afternoon. It'll be done by 3.30. Gene Adams Senior Caucus has got to get 30 people there. That's our number. What are we going to do to do that? Well, Lori Clark, our, ex our executive director, and a beautiful, wonderful organizer, not beautiful, wonderful organizer, gave me a list of names that I to call. I called all those names. I got 11 yeses, two uh, no's, and two uh, messages. Okay, there are four or five other people going to do this. We're going to get 45 yeses, and we're going to, chances are, 9 out of 10, produce 30 people at that convention. We will turn them out. That's called organize, organize, organize. Okay, well thanks Mandy for coming up here tonight and giving your, uh, your perspective on things. Um, I'll just uh, briefly address one topic that came up tonight and that's the the NDAA, uh, National Defense Authorization Act, and why it is in fact necessary. We are uh, at war <laughs> with Islamofascism, <laughs> with terrorism, <laughs> that would be economic and the president <laughs> has a, a duty to, uh, to defend the Constitution. And our enemies want to destroy the Constitution. He's also the, he's also the uh, head of the armed forces who are uh, sworn to uh, protect us from all enemies, foreign and domestic. Now, when you apprehend a terrorist, or a suspected terrorist, the time that you can flip that guy and make him come over to your side is about the first 24 or 48 hours. So that's why you want to be able to apprehend somebody and take them away to a secret location, interrogate them, <laughs> and try to flip them over to your side. Is that what happened to Janie? Before they, you know, you don't want to tip off all their, all their partners. So, oh, well, so that's why we don't have habeas corpus. That's why they're not allowed to get a lawyer to, to have a press conference and yada, yada, yada. I heard you You want to get these guys quick and try to flip them. And another thing is, you know, even if you can't flip them, you want to try to interrogate them and get information out of them again. You don't want to tip off all their handlers and their contacts going all the way back to who, who knows where, Yemen probably nowadays. You don't want to tip them off that you've got this guy that you're interrogating him. You want to try to get as much information as you can. Uh, so that's another reason why you need, you know, you want to suspend the abuse first. And, uh, and finally, it's a very strong tool. Having this power to uh, detain somebody indefinitely is a very strong tool in our arsenal that we can use to fight these guys. It's a very, you know, a very, uh, you know, heavy uh, tool that they're, you know, when you realize, when somebody realizes, hey, if I don't talk, they can just keep me here forever. Now, all, all you, uh, you know, wishy-washy pacifist liberals that are worried about this. They're <laughs> really worrying for, I think, a lot, a lot for nothing, you know, all this hand-wringing and it. Because, you know, the government, it's expensive to do this kind of stuff. And the government doesn't want to keep people that aren't really what we're really after. So, there, there's all kinds of precautions for this. You have, you have, this goes up to very high levels before they get uh, permission to take one of these guys and do this, you know, suspending a habeas corpus and detaining him indefinitely. Uh, and they are, uh, you know, checked. I mean, this, you know, there's status updates uh, done on these guys very often. So, so you know, it's, it's bad public relations to hold an innocent person. Everybody knows that. So the government doesn't want to do that. 
So what we're trying to do is get, you know, we want to nip these terrorist guys in the bud so we don't have any Madrids here like they did in Madrid with bombs blowing up in subways or uh, chemical attacks or who knows, who knows what, dirty bombs or whatever. So here's the, the thing you want to remember, folks, because the Constitution is not a suicide pact. Okay? We do not have to let terrorists win, let them in here, you know, cause all this mayhem bombing and stuff like that because of the, some, you know, thing we got written on a piece of paper. The president can use his discretion uh, to uh, do what he needs to do to defend us. And that's the legitimate role of the country, of the Constitution, uh, just like NATO is. You know, what we want, what we want the government to do is provide for the common defense, enforce contracts, and little else. And you see what happens when the government starts getting in everything else. We get this big giant apparatus that we can no longer report. Uh, and by the way, uh, Thayer uh, gave a, not Thayer, but uh, Joe Mayer uh, gave a sort of an inaccurate oh my. Go, uh, synopsis of what NATO was for. And the simple synopsis, three point plan, is NATO is for number one, to keep the Russians out, number two, to keep the Americans in, and number three, to keep the Germans down. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> so why are they in Libya? <laughs> well, I, I spent three nights in Grand Park. I got tear gas three times, and I was at Michigan and Balbo with the police church in 1968. And a lot of what I heard tonight is not exactly nostalgic, but it certainly brought back memories. <laughs> uh, and then I was at the 20th annual reunion in 1988 at the old uh, amphitheater on Halstead Street. And the recurring theme there was that uh, the only thing the people hated worse than us, worse than the war, was us. And that's what the, you know, Sherman Skolnick was in. He, he accused Abby Hoffman and Jerry Rubin and so on. I think Jerry Rubin died a few years earlier than that. But anyway, <coughs> being provocateurs, just trying to make the, uh, make the uh, peace movement look, anti war movement look, look, uh, look bad. Well, let me do. Well, I think what we've heard tonight, you know, I think the fact that people can be so easily, uh, you talk about all this deception, how, how does it happen? How do, how do people get uh, deceived so easily? Do people have any better truth detectors than that? I don't think so. Not around here, I don't see too much around here. I mean, oh, not. <laughs> but anyway, uh, uh, I'm afraid we're going to, you know, until we come up with some kind of systematic approach to human affairs that's just kind of uh, under a cabbage leaf right now, I think we're going to see lots of this going on. I think we're going to see more disasters. I, don't, I, I just think that maybe the biggest mistake you can make is to let your expectations get too high. Hi, I'm Rosalie, now from Evanston. I was not in Grant Park in 1968. I was in Saginaw, Michigan with four children under five, and I'm thinking, oh my God, i got to do something. Eventually, or not eventually, but actually right away, my doing something became um, identifying myself as a Christian anarchist, a member of the Catholic Worship Movement. Also, closely affiliated with Neighbors for Peace and as a member of the National Committee of War Resistance League, because I believe that secularist and faith-based people must work together for revolution. Now, the I want to speak just specifically about the subject of tonight, which is the protest against NATO, which should be abolished. We're going to have a permitted march 
on May 20th, and there is nothing the 99 or the 1% would like more than that there be violence at that march. We have a tremendous advantage as human beings in that most people do not want violence. Yes, America was founded on violence, and yes, we are a tremendously violent country with our expenditures. But most people would rather not have violence. And if we want to have the people of Chicago and the people of the United States with us for this revolution, I think it's very important, one, that they get out on the streets, and two, that they're convinced that this will be nonviolent. Now, we cannot, obviously, as Andy has so well said, we cannot control what other people can do. But we can, through nonviolence trainings, that as Andy said, there's been lots of them, and there still will be more throughout this city. Um, Starbuck is coming next week, for instance, to do a nonviolence training. And I'm sorry, I don't remember where it is, but it's in a union. Um, a union hall and sponsored by Occupy. We can take measures to isolate anybody that we see, particularly in provocateurs who are in the march. We can do all we can personally cooperate with the peace guides, which CanGate is providing. We can know how to react nonviolently to the police so that the real non the real violent people are shown for what they are the police. So I think all of us can convince our neighbors, yes, come out on March 20th, May 20th for the march. Come out. Don't be afraid. Don't let them intimidate us. But come out and do all you can to unspin the media that equates protest with violence because it does not have to be that way. It hasn't always been that way. The main victories in the last 150 years, Gandhi, Martin Luther King, all the uprisings in Eastern Europe have been through non the whole Egypt Spring, non-violent protests. It does not have to be violent. We don't have to be violent. And we don't have to be afraid of the violence. Thank you. Table there, there are lots of websites. I use this in a um, talk this afternoon at Evanston that give you um, all the educational things that are happening um, as lead ups and a whole lot of websites. So pick these up. All right, thank you. Join the warriors. All right, I wasn't originally going to come up here despite, despite some disagreement with our speaker because he, because, well, I'm opposed to much of his ideology. I'm a supporter of Barack Obama and of the Democratic Party. Still, he's articulated some things that need to be said. And certainly he has the same right to protest as anybody else does. But when our good friend and fellow student Bob Matter came up here a few minutes ago, <laughs> doesn't matter. And when he was busy defending uh, interrogation and waterboarding, without mentioning it, I felt that I had to say something about that. Now, I have also, I've often accused Bob of living in, the, in some kind of, of wanting to live in some kind of 19th century version of America in which either William McKinley or Benjamin Harrison was still the president of the United States. <laughs> uh, apparently this, this disease is worse than I thought. He apparently wants to live in a world in which uh, somebody like Stalin's last KB, KGB chief, Labyrinthi Beria, or Heinrich Himmler is in charge of internal security. I'm sorry, folks. That's not any kind of world I want to live in. And if our speaker tonight wants to protest against that kind of stuff, you go right ahead. I'll join you out on the street myself. Thank you. All right. I, I don't make a flyer through citizens taking the action to write your comments. Come on. <laughs> you too. I saw you using IBI stuff for your notes. Anyhow, let's thank Andy for a wonderful presentation and wonderful efforts.
it must be incredibly difficult dealing with all the real EPA guy. Thanks for you know I I really can appreciate putting together the the efforts here the the statement or political political statement on the streets you know uh, I mean dealing with the various groups you know dealing with like these movie guys you can imagine I. This is, <laughs> takes the patience of Joe, but I'll be eclectic as usual. Um, I, from the political science perspective, by the way, I was in I was in the streets in '68. I was only a freshman in college. I was basically overwhelmed by all of it. It just was the magnitude and to something I just didn't anticipate. But even then, actually, those are the only two significant things of 1968. Was I went to those, those events in the park, and I read uh, Karl Marx in the Communist Manifesto, <laughs> which I found rather intriguing. But anyhow, I, I regarding what he was saying about the helicopters, and I haven't kept up on the details. But I was always under the understanding that the United States Army, and let's talk about it, the United States military, was, was expected to do a lot of things, Bob, but it is not to be used against the citizens of the United States. And the same thing, but they tried to expand it in the drug war. I mean, it began with, I think they wanted to use helicopters or Coast Guard and things like that. I don't know, and quite frankly, the National Guard, there's various things, is used as the U.S. military and things of this nature. Now, to counter that, there, one of the, there's very few inherent functions of government, and one of the inherent functions is to preserve the public safety. And I don't want to get into the old liberty, freedom, dialogue, and things like that. But anyhow, that's just the two things I was going to bring up. Um, I, we've heard speakers here, by the way, uh, Joe talked about how we're all going to get burned up in some solar explosion. And then, of course, he heard about uh, 2012 in December. I still don't know what's going on in mid-September, Mike. I I think I'm going to get home early tonight. <laughs> but let me tell you a story, and it's going to take me a minute or two, but I'll get around to NATO. I'm Lithuanian, and in the early part of the century, Lithuanians, they, they, they had these things, they wanted to fly an airplane across the Atlantic. And two Lithuanians did it, Darius and Karanis. They weren't totally successful because they crashed. <laughs> and there's no, they, there's no credit here given them. It's because a bunch of out of Lugans in the United States. You know, crazy Lugans. <laughs> Anyhow, they were big heroes of Lithuania. And um, the thing is, Lithuania was a captive nation of the Soviet Union, and, and then it, it, it gained its independence 10 years ago or so. And we were very happy and proud and so forth. And one of the things, they joined the United Nations, and then they said, well, we'll join this NATO, because they had that commies. They didn't like the commies occupying the country. So then they said, well, there's going to be military maneuvers. And my friends who are military historians still give me a hard time on this. It's really unfair. But anyhow, the Lithuanian army showed up at NATO maneuvers with biplanes that Darius and Karenis had flown in 1925. <laughs> anyhow, thank you very much. And get out there on the 20th and let's bring some sanity to this. Thank you. Um, I wanted to uh, thank Andy for a great presentation, and also I wanted to ask you what your recommendations are. Um, and I don't want to, I don't want to raise anybody else's fear. Jesus, this is really a fearful crowd here. Um, but the, as far as uh, earplugs for the sound um, weapons, and also, um, it, are there any things that you, anything that you've heard of that might diminish anybody's? Um, uh, the vulnerability to tasers, like uh, rubberized, you know, 
heart bars or something, especially if you have a pacemaker or if you have heart disease or if you have a seizure disorder. Those would be the only things. I wouldn't personally be afraid of a taser myself, um, but if you had a significant uh, medical problem, and I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to invite a taser, but I wouldn't be afraid of some kind of serious, uh, you know, physical repercussions. So I'd like you to do us that. Um, number two, um, guys and gals, listen. I was at the TBA um, protest. There were 800 protesters. This was in 2003, Andy. 2002? Okay. So there were 800 protesters and there were 1,200 cops on horseback with five helicopters. It cost us five million dollars. We just, all we did, we saw what we were against. I had no idea. I wore a, a, a fake fur and I was in heels, okay, because I wanted to show up to a protest looking like a one percenter, right? And we just stuck together. I pulled ourselves away from the horses and nobody shot us. It was okay. We survived. And it was actually kind of fun because, you know, it was like, look at how powerful we are that daily brought out, you know, the mass of troops against us, okay? As long as you stayed away from the horses, you were safe. So please, relax, relax, okay? Number two, I personally live with a detective of the CPD. I don't live with him, he's my landlord just happened that way, didn't know he was a detective when I moved in. And he uh, works with the FBI. And he tells me all the time about how the CPD are kind of getting it, that they're protecting the bank robbers, right? The banksters that robbed us. <laughs> so they kind of get it. So I really want to encourage everybody that they're not that far away. I know that they have to take orders, but they're not that far away. So I just just want to let everybody know, um, have just some openness in your heart for the CPD. You can approach them. I do every single protest, and I'm at a protest every single week. And I talk to the cops all the time. And uh, they're more approachable than you think. The CPD, I'm not talking about the rented Blackwater, whoever they are, okay? Um, those I would kind of steer clear of because we don't really know what nationality or what whether they're actually human or not, right? So, um, number three, I think a lot of these questions that uh, people are saying, vote for Obama or protest, for the love of God, you have two hemispheres of your brain. You can do two things at the same time. You can vote for Obama and be in the streets. Am I perfectly clear? Serious. If you have to vote for Obama, I personally don't feel compelled to do that. But if you have to vote for Obama, you still can be in the streets. He even told us in his campaign that he is going to have to be pushed to stay to the left. And that's for sure, because he's moved to the right. So get out there and push him to the left. Thank you very much. Now, number five, one second, one more thing, and that is um, reparations. I think we should take the reparations out of the pensions of Congress. Uh, every member of Congress since the 1970s, we should cut their pensions by uh, three-fourths and uh, pay Honduras and pay El Salvador and pay Afghanistan and pay... <laughs> exactly. We don't need to pay those reparations. They need to pay the reparations. And, um, dear deluded sir, <laughs> please, please, Google 9-11 truth, would you? Serious business. The terrorists are in the high level of the military, the Mossad, the Israeli Mossad, and the Pakistani ISIS. Thank you very much.
fixing the Congress, the, the 290 Expressway, and, and it starts on Congress. And I hope that this is the reason that they're doing this practically every night. I hope they get it done in time. That's all. <laughs> It's for your own they good. We just they won't. They're protecting you. They want to. 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 It has several chapters about the uh, 1968 Democratic Convention demonstrations in it. And I'll just give them away if anybody's interested. Wow. Ooh. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. You want, you want to share? I'll share. Are you ready to give your last time? I have uh, others at home if you really want. Let's let her get the last words. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, in my opinion, though, the reason why Barack Obama and the administration is being so bad is because he's a Sox fan. Okay, um, I'd, I'd like to do my best at responding to individual comments and then just come back on, on one general thing. Bob, you've been watching too much Jack Bauer in 24 hours. <laughs> we must defend the Constitution by getting the NDAA. That recalls a, a, a message of the Vietnam War. We had to destroy the village in order to save it. Uh, someone brought up the issue again of the Marshall Plan. Um, it's important to note uh, that the United States had some 50% of the gross national product coming out of World War II. Today, by the way, it's 23% uh, of the gross domestic product. It's a little different than you discussed. But the point of the matter was, they were deathly afraid of a new Great Depression coming out of World War II. They wanted to have some markets for that 50% of world GNP, and that's a big reason why the Marshall Plan was, was passed overwhelmingly. Um, moving on. Uh, Dave, uh, I appreciate your comments. It, I, I have heard, you probably know this far better than I did, that the military is considered actually the, the greatest polluter in the world, the single greatest enemy. Anyone who knows anything about Hampton, Washington, Rocky Flats, any of the other just nuclear sites knows that. And should also be noted that there is now a cancer epidemic and birth defect epidemic raging in southern Iraq. And it doesn't take too much uh, two and two to put that together. It clearly is due to the depleted uranium oh, yeah. because that was one of the that was the major uh, theater of the Iraq uh, U.S. war. Andy, not only that, but the, the Russian military is, is almost as bad as the Americans in <laughs> I, I I don't doubt it. I've heard Absolutely. about it. Information about the conditions there for, for uh, uh, people in the Russian military is, is absolutely awful. I mean, you think that the, the conditions that uh, the uh, uh, economic draftees of our own uh, uh, armed forces have it bad. They have it even worse, uh, from my understanding, the Russian uh, army armed forces. But that's a digression. Uh, Frank mentioned uh, the whole issue of, of Latin America and got me to thinking about the issue of the elections that other people had, had bought up, brought up. And you, you look at what has happened when people have attempted to make the change electorally and actually been successful within the terms of the electoral process. I'm thinking of when uh, a few anti-war congressmen were elected in the run-up to World War I, and of course the U.S. Congress refused to seat them. Uh, that was their response, and the worst response, of course, was uh, the overturn of Salvador Allende and the thousands who died in, in San Diego uh, Stadium, and, and that's just one of the worst effects. I mean, this, this country and rulers around the world have got a, a long-standing tradition of overthrowing with uh, the barrel of a gun elections that they don't like in terms of having gone their own way. So I don't think we can rely on the ballot box as the way to free us. It can be a useful, uh, shall we say, public relations element. And I think what uh, the Socialist Party and Eugene V. Debs did, and especially in the run-up to, to World War I, was brilliant in that regard. And, and, and actually, 
offers a model for how electoral politics should be exercised today, and that's why I point to strongly encouraging our green friends to draft Bradley Manning to be a, a presidential candidate to show the hypocrisy of our constitutional law scholar president um, as, he, as he goes after one of, the, uh, of America's leading heroes. Um, uh, Laura, you, you talked about various uh, uh, sound cannon and tasers and so forth. I, I'm not an expert about this. There is stuff on websites that can be found uh, about this. I think uh, Chicago Action Medical and various other uh, uh, things. But the, the, the kind of march that we're talking with uh, for Sunday, uh, May 20th, is we're, we've got a permitted march for a reason that we are doing our damnedest to make sure that it is indeed uh, nonviolent, it is family friendly, and we're sending the message that uh, it is absolutely reprehensible what uh, uh, Mayor Emanuel is doing in terms of hyping the violence fears, uh, it, it's absolutely reprehensible with the federal government, and I hold Barack Obama directly responsible for this kind of intimidatory uh, uh, red zone nonsense that's going on in the, in the yeah. South Loop beginning uh, next Tuesday. Um, I think one of our best protections, frankly, will be that the eyes of the world will be on Chicago. Uh, this is an election year. I think our rulers in that respect are not so stupid as to repeat the history of 68, because they saw what it did for them. Um, my next comments are more uh, uh, aimed at, at Brad and, and, and Rosalie. Um, I, to insist that it, for us to, to, to emphasize any more than I have been that we are for a legal permitted march and to say, well, are you going to be a nonviolent Andy? Are you going to be a nonviolent Andy? Again, I have yet to hear a single question directed at the Chicago police along these lines. And at a certain point, I feel like I'm being asked, Andy, when will, when will you stop beating your spouse? I mean, frankly, that's what I have never organized a demonstration in which there has been any significant uh, violence. No, I can't control. Uh, everyone who uh, uh, participates in, in a demonstration. But I think that, that, that the Chicago police have got a long-standing tradition of illegal violence, and it's about time yes, we turned the message around and said, when will you, Mayor Emanuel, stop? Uh, uh, I mean, this is a guy who's got a pro-war voting record when he was congressman that was second to none in the Chicago area con congressional de delegation. Uh, this is a man who fronted for the 1% in Congress in a way that was uh, so great that he was the number one recipient of campaign donations from the financial services industry. This is a man who volunteered uh, as a civilian for the uh, uh, Israeli Defense Force. I mean, the list goes on. They've got a history of violence on their side. It's about time for us to, to turn that, that message around. No one in this movement is talking the way they say Abby Hoffman did, and I know he did it in jest, but frankly, the people on the other side were so stupid they took it literally about putting acid in Chicago's water supply or any of that kind of nonsense. No one's talking about that. Um, hey, that would be fun. <laughs> Um, I, I didn't, you know, I was eight years old, but I didn't want Richard Milhouse Nixon to be a, uh, elected president. The point of the matter is the Democrats got what they deserved in, 2000, in, in, in 1968. And frankly, if Barack Obama loses in 2012, he's got no one but himself to blame. He has given us the Bush third term that we were warned we would get if, if uh, and McCain got into office. Um, in terms of this whole notion about him insisting, well, it's our fault for not pushing the Democratic Party to the left. <laughs> Excuse me, every time people have attempted to move this Democratic Party to the left, they've got their face slapped by this party. Absolutely. Okay? Look at the way that the Occupy movement has been systematically rolled up in city after city after city. It has been a coordinated campaign, and the federal government, for the vast majority of this president's term, was controlled by the Democratic Party. The things that they could have done when they had both houses of Congress, the 
then turn around and blame the left for what has happened? I mean, remember, it was our own Rahm Emanuel who referred to the left as effing retards or something to that effect. That is the level of contempt that the Obama administration has for everyone in this room, with the exception of Bob. <laughs> beyond May uh, is, oh, well, you, you got to go for the, you, just look at what Looney Tunes those Republicans are. They're awful, and they are awful. Don't get me wrong. They're utterly disgusting. I mean, the one thing you can say is that at least Mitt Romney has been on both sides of every single issue the way that Barack Obama has. So it's hard to keep them straight. <laughs> But I would go back to what Bruce Dixon, who is a leading light at uh, the Black Agenda Report, said about the true role of people like Barack Obama and other allegedly left Democrats. Are they the lesser evil, or are they the more effective evil? They are the more effective evil. You look at the things that the Democrats have been able to get away with in the last three and a half years, and it's far beyond the wildest dreams of someone like Ronald Reagan. Uh, I mean, the record deportations, the record military budget, the record attacks on civil liberties. I mean, assassinating people abroad, judge, jury, and executioner. I mean, these are the sort of things that we're told can only come from a far-right Republican like Santorum, who is a notorious warmonger, homophobe, sexist, and everything else. The problem for their side is that he is a one percenter who represents himself as a one percenter. And so people aren't fooled by him. But Barack Obama and the Democrats represent themselves as 99 percenters. And that's why they've been able to get away with it. And that's why we need to recognize both parties as being uh, the enemy of everyone in this room, with the exception of Bob. <laughs> we, I'd just like to finish up on this. We have unique opportunity in Chicago here for the first time in a generation to push back against the one percent. We, we have not only an opportunity, but I would say a political obligation. The world is going to be coming to Chicago, and it is our duty, I believe, as Chicagoans to do our damnedest to have the strongest opposition possible to the policies of the 1%. We are in America's longest ever war. I can remember growing up as a younger man, and we'd have a war here, peace for a year, for maybe six months. Another war here for a couple of years, peace for a couple few months. Another war here, and that was disgusting enough. We are now in permanent war. We are in permanent empire. That's why we're getting things like the NDAA. These attacks on civil liberties are part and parcel of empire. We are in an endless war right now. And it's up to us to turn it around. We have got to stop the slide into empire, stop the slide into the attacks on civil liberties, stop the slide into police state. And we've got to do it the way it's always been done which is in the streets.